Take it away, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Thanks for pointing out. Yes, yeah, so I, I, as you said, I have a problem. I am the presenter between you and lunch. But in the spirit of today, let me turn that problem into an opportunity and follow along in Dave's fine words. Think of it as if I were providing you lunch. That's the one thing that will get you all to agree with me, as you learned earlier today. So lunch is on me. Um, so yes, I think we're going to hear a lot today. And, and as, as Gottfried said in the beginning, and as Derek said and Kurt said, you're not here to listen to me. Right? We're here to listen and share information about what real people are doing out there in the world. What I'm going to try and do here, just before we all head off and get some food, is tie this kind of move, these kind of transitions into what we're doing and specifically how it's really a joint journey. Where we've come from, where we are going together, and so you get a little bit of a picture because obviously people, you know, some people, the journey hasn't started yet. You're already all doing very well. You should give yourselves a pat on the back because you're here. The vast majority of the industry and a lot of your competitors, they are not in a room like this. They are still waiting for the release approval from 200,000 years ago when humanity came into existence. That's typically, in my view, how long releases normally seem to mentally take. Um, so, yes, there's already a great step that's been made simply by coming here. But obviously, um, there's a journey uh, that, that we will all go on in, in terms of uh, an evolution. And, I mean, I think the first thing I should say is, from our perspective as labs, well, what are we doing? Well, we are there to be the technical bedrock of this journey. You can call it continuous delivery, you can call it DevOps, we can call it lots of other things. We can talk about experimental organizations, about customer-obsessed organizations, and I think we'll use a whole bunch of these phrases, and I have to start talking a bit more quickly because I guess lunch will get cold. But that's really, I think, how you need to think about us in, ter in relation to this journey that you're thinking about yourselves. So I think the first thing you need to know is that we've all been there. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, of colleagues, former colleagues from ZB also in the room. Like, we've wrestled the ball of mud. Like, we have sat there and uh, sometimes written and sometimes suffered from the 100-page deployment manuals. We have been through merge hell. Like, we've all been there. We're not saintly. Um, and I think it's important for you to know that we know what this pain is. And in fact, this pain, to a large extent, the experience of this pain gave rise to where we are as an organization today. And I think it puts us obviously in a great position to help you if you recognize some of these symptoms yourself, such as the, the 200,000 year release window. So I think we all know, I mean, we, we all know the ball of mud, we all know the release manuals, and we've heard it today a few times already, we can do better. That's what we felt at the time. I think that's what a lot of people feel today. And maybe more strongly than we can do better, we have to do better. Um, I'm not going to go belabor the whole point about every company's and, and tech organization, disruption, disruption. You've heard that a million times already in every single webinar and slide deck over the past two years. Long story short, you know this, we all know this, and I think that's largely the reason why we're here. So why are we here? Well, we're here because together I think we can transform the way you deliver software in your organizations. I don't have pictures of Muppets. I'm unfortunately, I have to apologize for that. I, I do have pictures of rockets. I can tell you about that. I got that one right. So I like rockets. I also like Richard Feynman. I don't have a picture of him. But the first thing I was going to say, a little bit of an aside, is the hit and miss. Because I think that's a really nice theme we have going through the presentation today. And I wanted to talk a bit about mine. I've cheated because the hit and the miss are kind of two sides of the same coin. So you could say that's a little bit of cheating. Um, the hit is basically that, I had to find a good picture from mindset. Whatever we call it, DevOps, continuous delivery, accelerated software delivery, customer focus, it's a mentality. If you go into a highly, a team that does this well, they don't talk about doing continuous delivery. Or they don't talk about doing DevOps. It's not necessarily something that comes up in daily conversation. It's just what they do. It's like doctors don't have whole theories about how to measure pulse. It's just something that they do if it's in your mentality. So I think we all want to get to the point where thinking about optimizing our process is just a natural way of thinking. It's not a seminar that we go to, a training class we have on Mondays. It's just the way the team works. It's the way the organization works. I think Andreas made some very interesting points. This is not just at the level of the people who write the code. This permeates an entire organization. And I think we'll come back to that in a little bit. So 
that being the hit, well, the miss is, oh, no, the miss is putting a label on it and making it someone's problem or someone's role or someone's department. You know, when you walk in that organization and there's a door and the door says DevOps, here live DevOps, like that's then not when you're doing it the right way. Because that sort of devolves the responsibility for this to somebody else. Of course, there's a requirement to have expertise and guidance and, you know, when you get started. But we're not trying to build ourselves a DevOps unit. We're trying to make our organization think in a way that makes us better able to serve the needs of our customers. That's what we're after, not the, the, the memory stick. Okay, that's the hit, that the miss. So, this journey, the journey that, that a lot of you are on in various phases, some of you might be considering going on, what does it look like? It's obviously a continuous process. It's, you know, it's not short, like as we've heard, some of this takes years. It might even take longer than that, and it's maybe never even totally over because there is always more you can improve. But just so that you don't feel like, oh my God, this is gonna be this weird process, it's gonna go on forever. Let's try and break it down into three phases, because these are, the, I think, the ones that we really commonly see if we look at how we work together with customers and, and where they go. Um, and let's also talk a little bit about what we do to help you in each phase, because that's also how we think of how we are able to deliver value. So. The three phases that I'm going to talk about, and I don't think they're official terms or anything, but maybe you'll recognize some of them. The first one is the sort of coordination automation phase. Then you get into the scaling, and then you get into phase three, which we can call many things. I like customer-centric enterprise, experimental organizations, another good one. Lots of names for this. I'll try to spend more time on that because I think that's you know, more forward-looking. That's what we should be spending on, but I'll obviously talk about the other two a little bit as well. So the first one. So where, do you, where, where did we come from? Where does the ball of mud start? Well, oh my God, that really didn't render well at scale, did it? Ugh. Anyway, so most of us know the, the sort of situation of being in kind of organic controlled anarchy. Stuff somehow gets done, sort of, and it's not as efficient as we might like it, but it sort of gets done. And in every attempt to put some kind of structure in place seems to make things worse, and so we're always kind of stemming the tide and so on. And, yeah, that, that's not a great place to be. I mean, we've heard it many times today, like the status quo, at some point you have to accept that that doesn't work. Um, and if you're doing things manually or if you're firefighting, if you're trying to coordinate on lots of phone calls, I've been on these phone calls. They're not fun once. They're especially not fun when they happen every single Saturday for an entire month or six month period on end. And, and then the Monday afterwards because the deployment failed. So we've all been there. And so I think the first thing that we do as an organization and what we deliver with our products is we deliver automation and coordination. And those are the two essential first building blocks because what they allow you to do is they allow you to move away from the continuous ongoing phone calls to a place where even if you're not happening to be sitting in the same room, everybody can have a picture of what's going on. There's some interesting discussions I was having earlier about how this can help if you're doing outsourced work. You know, historically, that's a very difficult set up if you want to get good insight and visibility into what's going on because let's face it people don't necessarily always tend to be totally open and transparent the other thing is automation like if you're investing work today in in hitting buttons um, it makes much more sense to put that same kind of investment into an automation building block where you do the investment once and then the system works for you so those are the two i guess the two first really big things and of course we've been in this game for a really long time Comparatively speaking, it's a young industry, but we've been in there really pretty much since the beginning. We've built and continue to innovate, but we've built some very cool and necessary stuff for those two basic building blocks. So we have agentless cross-platform automation. Most of you know this, of course, already. We have rich support for data and variable management, which some of you may not know that well. It's actually surprisingly hard. Like if you're building a long automated process, you need to inject information at different points in time. You need to extract information from other tools so that they can be passed on to others. That can be surprisingly difficult to do in the automation frameworks that are out there. So for those of you who have a technical bend and have done this, this is actually pretty painful. So we have some pretty unique automated orchestration and rollback capabilities. Most every tool allows you to tell it to do all kinds of stuff in sequence. Very few give you the capability to capture orchestration as a strategy to say, you know, Blue, green, canary, 
you know, 10 at a time, but not the ones in Asia on a Sunday morning, those kind of strategies. That you can do that in a sort of policy-driven way in our systems, and then the same goes for rollback. We have some very intelligent stuff there. We have a powerful, flexible extension model. There's some sound cracking going on. Yes, we have a bunch of out-of-the-box stuff as well from all kinds of stuff across the park, from you know ALM to load balancers to mainframe, to you name it. But in a large enterprise organization, you will inevitably reach the limits of what any out-of-the-box vendor, no matter how many hundreds of thousands of people they employ, because none of them work on your tool, but that's a different story. Um, you need a powerful extension model. You need to have something where once you get to the limit, you don't have to get on the phone, but the system is designed from the get-go to be extended in many, many different ways. And I think we do a very good job of putting in lots of extension APIs. I'm pretty sure there are maybe only one or two people in the room who actually know them all and use them all. There's a lot of capability. You can't just deploy to different targets. That's obvious. You can put in new server-side endpoints. You can put in your own UI pages and reports. There's very cool stuff you can do with our tools. We do chat ops integration because, you know, nowadays teams like to live in Slack or Campfire or HipChat or whatever, and we want to live there with them. And you can talk to Martin Van Fleet who's running around somewhere who can tell you everything about that. So that's all good. That can goes on. All right. Looking at the time. Phase two. So that's like the basics, like phase one. You get one team, you get them away from the manual stuff and the firefighting, you get them automated, that's fine. It's not easy to do, but it's certainly doable, but it becomes a lot more challenging when you want to move from the, you know, the single snowflakey space shuttle on the left, the satellite, to the sort of CubeSat approach. Like when you start to take automation, delivery improvements, and you try to scale it out to an organization, that there's lots of things that happen that make, make the problem more complicated, right? So you have large amounts of data. I mean, um, where one team might have 10 processes, an organization might have 10,000 or 100,000. Really, the easiest way to think about scale is multiply everything by 10,000 or something along those lines. The size, the numbers, the, you know, the types of people involved. And then you start to figure out whether your systems can handle it. Because a system that can display 10 things may have a really hard time at displaying 10,000 things. So we've got some very, very cool technology and innovation that we've had over the years and that we obviously continue to put in in this area as well. One nice example is Satellite, which is a very unique, actually, uh, distributed agentless execution platform to handle all the nastiness that happens if you're in a global environment. Similarly, you saw nice screenshots of the release flow earlier. That's nice if you have 20 or 30 tasks. And don't get me wrong, you shouldn't try to have more. But we have customers who have hundreds or thousands of tasks in their release. And then you need a different type of visualization to make this kind of stuff work for you. So yeah, I mean, I mentioned this already. Um, support for target platforms. Obviously, we continue to expand our work in that space as new platforms come on stream. We're looking at some of the IoT stuff, for instance, all that kind of stuff. Containers we heard earlier today. My God, the container space is so confused. But yes, of course, we continue to look at that all the time as well. We had some nice unintentional, I wasn't aware of this, discussion about dependencies. If you're in a modern, certainly if you're going to a microservice environment, one of the things that breaks isn't your app. It's the way your app connects to all the 8 million other apps in your environment. And then you go to a different environment, and one of those 8 million connections is just slightly off and bang. All your tests are useless. So we have some pretty unique deployment time dependency checking, which is very cool and which you can use. We have multi-release patterns because you're not just releasing a single thing. You're releasing 15 of them, and they depend on each other in interesting ways. We have some rich data organization and governance. We heard about compliance. There's, there's more coming on that front. To look at the data in the right way, you have to give the right people the right kinds of access and so on. And then, of course, the scalable view stuff, right? Making sure that as you go from one team, as you start having different projects, different business units, different application styles, however you like to slice and dice your data, that the tools can give those people who need to see their little bit the right way of looking at that. Dot, dot, dot. I'm getting short on time here already. All right, so now, phase three. And I, this is really the phase that I think is most interesting because, of course, while we'll continue to innovate on the automation and the control side on the kind of phase one and phase two, visibility, if you look at some of our uh, marketing and messaging, you'll see those three mentioned very often, you know, automation, visibility, control. Visibility is one that I think is especially interesting because let's face it, is our journey 
finished when we have a great software delivery process. When it's scalable and it's automated and it's nice. Well, I would say no. Why not? Because none of us as organizations exist, maybe, may, maybe just with the exception of us, but nobody here in the room exists to be a software delivery organization. Like that's not what you can go to your shareholders and say, we did software delivery. Now, please, can you sort of raise our valuation? Um, we all exist to serve our customers. So let's look over the horizon. Let's you know, think of enterprise like, where do we want to go with this? Where is this heading? Well, it's heading to the point, so we think, or we hope, it's heading to the point where basically the process goes away in the sense that you've optimized it to the point that you don't have to worry about it anymore. And as Dave said earlier, once the cycle time comes down, there are some very interesting second and third level effects that come around. But I mean, what I'm basically trying to say is that it's those second and third level effects that we really should care about. Because ultimately, the cycle time is good. It's thinking about becoming a, a customer-centric or an experimental organization that will make the difference. So this is the, the, the famous, of course, the Amazon story. Never been in an Amazon board meeting, so unfortunately, I can't personally tell you if it's true or not. But there is the story that every Amazon board meeting has an empty chair to represent the customer, not the Messiah, but the customer who is always present at every board meeting. And I've spoken to many, many people who've worked for Amazon, have been uh, bought by Amazon, and they say like the one thing that is really true about that organization is that customer obsession value that they have there isn't just some nice thing they put on a poster that makes everybody feel good. They use it in meetings. Like you can have a technical argument in a meeting and somebody can say this will not work for the customer and then the meeting is over. And that's apparently real. Well, that's, I actually know because I've sat in one of those meetings. But this is where we want to go. I had a discussion with a, a very senior guy, CD architect at Netflix. And he said, you know, to be honest, all the tooling in the world, everybody can download Spinnaker makes no difference. Like it'll get you to phase one and phase two. It'll clean up some of your automation. It'll make the process a little easier. It'll help you with your cycle time. If you can't get that mentality change into your head, how do we turn our developers or if they already thinking about their customer, how do we enable them to do those experiments? How do we put them in a position where they are thinking in this way, that they have the ideas, they want to try out these new things and that the systems enable this to be possible. So what you'll see, I think, from us increasingly the coming weeks, months, years, is a focus on helping you understand not just how the process is working, but what's in that process. What's the stuff that we're pushing out? What are the features that are in there? What are the ideas that are behind them? What are the hypotheses that we're pushing out? What were the original comments we made about how we would validate these hypotheses? And of course, also what the commits are and the issues and the fixes and all that good stuff. But not just, and there's of course many different variants of this dashboard, lots of different data that you can put in there, but the theme I'm trying to focus on here is visibility. It's understanding what's in your releases, not just what you're pushing out, but what impact they have. And making that data available, not just to the, the five people who sit in the marketing ivory tower who look at the sort of end of month chart numbers and then keep the data to themselves. If I as a developer have written a feature, I wanna know. I want to know what it did. And that requires me to have this all underlying delivery system to help me. That requires phases one and two, but it's phase three that enables me to become that customer obsessed or customer interested or whatever developer. And that's what ultimately will make the organizations that are successful, successful. That is ultimately what differentiates an Amazon and a Netflix and the, the classic disruptive organizations from the others. Not the technology they have, but the way they conceive of the problem of doing software development. That's not what they live for. They live for serving the customer. Software delivery is just a necessary evil that has to happen along the way. And I'll, I can continue, of course, at long length for this, but I just regurgitate more of what Dave has already said, so I just refer you to his excellent slides earlier in the day. Um, let me close then by saying that, you know, where do we see ourselves? We are there to be the partner, the, 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 the technical bedrock, the guidance, the expertise, the tooling to guide you along that journey that you were going to go towards becoming that customer-driven organization that you're trying to become. And wherever you are, what stage of your journey, 
obviously our job is to continue to innovate and to be there where you are and of course also ahead of where you are so that when you get to that point you know where to go you know who can help you um, with tools with features with products with guidance with stuff thank you very much <laughs>